Okay, so I, I guess let's uh, get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, trustworthy uh, machine, uh, trustworthy data science and AI seminar series. Uh, and this is actually, uh, I think, the last uh, um, uh, seminar in this year, and we're going to continue uh, in, uh, next uh, spring as well. Um, so today, our uh, speaker is Professor Jian Tang, uh, who is currently uh, an assistant professor at the Mila AI, uh, Quebec AI Research Institute. Uh, and also uh, a professor at uh, HEC Montreal, which is the business school uh, of uh, the University of Montreal. So uh, today uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, drug, uh, graph uh, representation learning for uh, drug discovery. Uh, professor Jian Tang has, uh, uh, has been very active uh, uh, in these uh, areas and uh, he is also currently a Canada CIFAR AI Research Chair. Um, he has been publishing extensively in uh, top venues, for example, ICML, uh, WWW, which is the uh, current of the web conference. Uh, he got his PhD from uh, Peking University back in 2014 and was an uh, associate researcher at uh, MSRA uh, between 2014 and 2016. Uh, also uh, was a joint postdoc fellow at uh, University of Michigan and the CMU. Um, so uh, his, his work has been uh, recognized by multiple uh, different awards, uh, including those from industries uh, such as from Amazon and Tencent Faculty Research Award. Uh, he's also one of the uh, most representative researchers in this field of uh, uh, graph representation learning. And uh, uh, some of his work, uh, I think, uh, uh, has been uh, recognized as the uh, most uh, cited uh, papers uh, at uh, the uh, WW conference between 2015 and 2019. Uh, so we're super excited to have uh, Professor Jian Tang today. Uh, and uh, without uh, further ado, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Please get started. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Tianjin, for the nice introduction. And also thanks, Professor Pei, for the invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our, our recent progress on uh, using graph reputation learning techniques for drug discovery. So I'm going to I'm going to um, start by introducing um, uh, the process of drug discovery. So basically, drug discovery is a very um, expensive and also a long process. So on average, it takes more than um, 10 years and also 2.5 billion US dollars to get a new drug approved. So the process is usually like this. So given a, a, a drug target, so most of the time it's a, it's a protein or, a, or an enzyme. And then um, in the stage of lead discovery, so we are gonna, to, uh, we are gonna screen uh, millions of molecules from the component library to see which molecule could, uh, could bind to the protein target. So in this process, basically we are, we are able to identify a few lead components. Okay. And then these compounds are not perfect. That's why in, in the stage of lead optimization, so we are gonna further modify the lead compounds a little bit, okay, in order to improve their uh, properties. For example, we may want to reduce the toxicity of the, of, the, of, of the compounds, okay. And then after this stage, so we are able to identify a few uh, drug uh, candidates, okay. And then, um, we are going to further evaluate these drug candidates through preclinical uh, pre study, for example, through uh, animals. And then if the drug candidates are able to pass the, the, the animal, uh, the preclinical study, so we are going to further uh, send them for um, clinical trials. Okay. So in clinical trials, we have multiple different phases. I think uh, usually there are three different phases. Okay. And, and most of the drugs will fail in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the clinical trial uh, stage. Um, so in the, you can see that in the process of a drug discovery, the most important data are actually molecules. And, and the molecules can actually be represented as a graph. So each node is, a, uh, is an atom. So there, could, uh, there, there are different kinds of like bonds or different kinds of edges between, uh, between, the, between the atoms. Okay, so that's why uh, graph repetition learning are very really useful and also um, uh, important for, 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 drug, uh, for drug discovery process uh, uh, because we can, we can use those techniques to analyze molecules. Okay, so here um, I summarize the, the most uh, fundamental research problems in, 
in, in drug discovery. So the first, the first problem is really to uh, mark your property prediction. So which is a very fundamental machine learning, uh, fundamental problem in, in both the stage of lead discovery and the lead optimization. So basically in this stage, given a specific molecule, we want to predict their chemical property, right? So this is really, this is really important. For example, if you want to um, identify a molecule which, which could potentially um, uh, hit a, 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 a protein. Okay. So these are the first fundamental machine learning problem. The second uh, fundamental problem is related to molecule design and optimization. So this process um, is the inverse problem of, uh, of molecule property prediction. So in this case, so we are given a property, then our goal is trying to find a molecule which is able to satisfy the given property, right? So, so this process is very important in the, in, in, in the stage of lead optimization, because in this stage, we are really trying to find a molecule to satisfy uh, a set of property, okay? So once a molecule is identified, okay, and then, um, the next problem is, re, uh, is related to how are we able to synthesize this molecule in practice because the molecules we, we designed may not exist in nature and, and actually most of the time they, 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 they don't exist. So the our goal is, um, uh, the question here is, are we able to synthesize this molecule based on the existing ones. So this relates to the, the, the problem of retrosensor prediction. So basically given a target molecule, are we able to find a set of like reactants, a set of like existing molecules, which could be used to, to synthesize the, the, the given molecule. Yeah. So in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about our, our recent progress in each of the three uh, problems. So, so in terms of the, the, pro, uh, the problem of molecule property prediction, as I mentioned, it's a very fundamental problem in drug discovery, for example, in the stage of like virtual screening or even in lead optimization is very important. Okay? And the machine learning we know, if you want to make a very effective prediction, it's very important to have a good feature representation of the data. So here, as, as we mentioned in the beginning, we can represent each molecule as a graph. So therefore, the fundamental problem, uh, the fundamental machine learning problem here is how are we able to uh, learn very good feature repetition for the whole molecular graph? Okay, so this is a fundamental machine learning problem uh, uh, we are going to tackle here. Um, in the existing literature, of course, uh, we see uh, growing interest in using graph neural network for learning the repetitions. Of the, of the graph. So we have some, we have the uh, vanilla uh, uh, graph conversion networks and also graph attention networks and, and also many recent other uh, variants. Okay. So in general, all the graph neural network can somehow be uh, summarized into the neural message passing framework. So basically uh, we, uh, we will define a message uh, passing function. Okay, so, so here, um, um, for each node, so we have some messages um, from their neighbors. So we have, we have a message, pass, message function which defines on um, each edge. So this includes the information of the, the source node repetition, the information of the, uh, the target node, node repetition, and also the information of the edge uh, as well. Okay, so these are how we are able to define the, the messages which will be um, uh, sent uh, between the nodes. Okay, and then uh, once we have messages from, from each of the neighbors, we further define an aggregate function, which is basically trying to aggregate all the messages from my neighbors, right? So by aggregating, aggregating all the messages from my neighbors, I can, I can get the aggregated messages. Okay? And then we can further combine the aggregate, aggregate messages with uh, the, the repetition of the node itself. So by doing this, we can get a new node repetition. So we can do this for all the nodes, we can do this iteratively. And then after multi, uh, multiple layers uh, of new, uh, of, um, so after multiple layers of uh, graph new network, uh, let's say after, after K layer, each node will be represented as a, a, with its final node repetition as the HBK. Okay? And then, in order to get the repetition of the whole graph, so we can have a read out layer, or sometimes we, we can say pulling layer, which try to uh, pull all the, uh, 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 the information from all the nodes 
to get the repetition of the whole graph. So sometimes the rate of function can simply, um, uh, uh, as a summation, for example, we can take the summation of all the node repetition to get the repetition of the whole graph. So usually um, the, the graph neural network or the neural massive passing framework can be trained uh, with supervised learning uh, techniques. So that means, so we are given a set of molecules and their, and their, and their properties and train the whole uh, architectures. However, this, this is actually a big challenge for, uh, for uh, uh, problems in drug discovery because in drug discovery, obtaining the label data is very expensive and also uh, time consuming. Think about if you want to um, get the property or understand the chemical uh, activities of molecules, you, you actually need to set up a, a, a bioassay, so which is really time consuming and, and expensive. Okay. So that's why in this project, um, uh, which is published in, in this year's iClear, okay, so our goal is trying to learn the whole graph repetition in unsupervised or semi-supervised fashion. That means, so we are trying to leverage the unlabeled data uh, or, or unlabeled molecules to learn uh, effective molecular graph repetition. Okay. So this work is mainly done by uh, one of my uh, uh, previous intern, Fang Yunsun, uh, uh, who is now a PhD student at Stanford. Okay. So the, the essential idea of infograph is trying to um, maximize the mutual information between the, the whole graph repetition and also all the substructural repetition in, in the graph. Okay. So, so, so if we are able to maximize the mutual information between the, between the whole graph re repetition and also all the substructure, that means uh, the whole graph repetition is able to capture the predominant information um, among all the substructure. So this is some high level idea. So more specifically, we can use a uh, multiple layer graph neural network or, or let's say K-layer graph neural network. In each, uh, in each layer, so we have some uh, aggregate layer or, or aggregate function and also combine functions to iteratively update the, 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 the node repetition. And then um, we can actually summarize all the um, all the local structure information centered at every node i. For example, h uh, phi i here represent all the uh, all the um, all the sub all the substructure centered at node i. So we can do this by concatenating on the um, the node repetition um, uh, the the repetition of node i in different layers. Remember that the repetitions of node i in different layers basically capture the substructure of different granularity, right? So, so and then we can con concatenate all of them, and then we can get the, the, the information uh, of all the substructure, uh, of, of all the substructure uh, uh, centered at node i. Okay, so these are how we get the node repetition. And then we can further summarize the information uh, of all the nodes. So basically we can use some readout function to get the repetition of the whole graph. Okay. And then we try to uh, maximize the mutual information between the whole graph re repetition and also uh, the substructural repetition. So here, uh, this term um, represents uh, the mutual information between the, the two random variables. And, we, and this can be actually, uh, 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 we can sum over all the different substructure in the, uh, in the graph, and then we can uh, uh, take the average, right? So we can do this for all the graphs. Uh, in the training data. Okay. So these are all uh, uh, final objective function to learn the graph re repetition. Okay. And then the challenge here is how are we able to um, uh, estimate the mutual information between the two random variables? Because in, in statistics or in machine learning, uh, it's actually a very challenging problem to estimate the mutual information between two random variables. So, uh, so there are different uh, kinds of like techniques to uh, which try to estimate a low bound of the mutual information. So here, uh, we use a JSON shallow mutual information estimator, which looks like this. Um, so it looks very complicated, but, but actually the idea is pretty simple, which is, which is very similar to the recent uh, contrastive learning uh, idea. So I can explain in this way. Uh, suppose you have a molecule, right? And then you have a molecule graph, and then you use multiple layers graph new network to learn the, uh, the node repetition. Let's say here is H5U is uh, the, the rotation of node U or the, the, the rotation of all the sub, uh, substructure centered at node U. Okay? 
and then you have a pooling layer to get the repetition of the uh, the whole graph. Okay, and then what we are going to do is we are going to uh, train a discriminator, discriminator to distinguish whether a pair of the whole graph uh, or um, and the substructure whether they are from the same graph or not. For example, for this for these two. So they, they, they can be treated as positive instance, okay? And then we can also randomly sample another substructure uh, from another graph. Uh, so we can treat this whole graph repetition and also um, the, 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 the repetition of this substructure as a negative pair, okay? So this is treat as, uh, treated as a negative uh, instance. So we're going to train a discriminator to, to distinguish whether the, the whole graph rotation and the substructure rotation, whether they are from the same graph or not. So this is basically the, uh, 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 the same idea as recent contrastive learning idea. Okay. So this is uh, how we are able to uh, learn the unsupervised graph rotation. So we further extend this idea to the semi-supervised uh, uh, learning setting. So basically in this setting, so we have two kinds of loss functions. So one is the unsupervised loss function based on mutual information maximization idea. So another is the classical supervised uh, uh, loss function, for example, the cross entropy loss function. So if we are doing a graph classification, okay. And then a simple way to do semi-supervised learning could be uh, simply combine the two uh, loss function. And for, uh, for example, we can use the same encoder in the supervised uh, training and also the unsupervised training. Okay. However, uh, such kind of method could be problematic because the two objectives may not agree with each other. So suppose we use the same encoder, but this same encoder may not be able to satisfy both uh, objectives. Sometimes it could lead to the problem of like a negative transfer. Okay. So that's why we, uh, we actually introduced um, another uh, more advanced technique. So in this, in this, in this model, so we, have a, so we have a different encoder for the two objectives. So basically we have a graph encoder for the supervised uh, loss. And also we have another encoder for the, uh, for the unsupervised loss based on the mutual information maximization uh, objective, right? And then we also need to make sure the two objectives will be able to uh, collaborate and also transfer uh, uh, supervision or knowledge a, a across the, the, the two objectives. So here we use a mutual information maximization idea again. So what are we are gonna do here is we try to maximize the mutual information between the, the graph repetitions learned by the supervised encoder and also the unsupervised encoder. So remember that for each molecule, we can have a repetition learned by the uh, supervised encoder. So we can also have another repetition learned by the unsupervised uh, encoder. And then we can, we can try to maximize their mutual information. So actually we can do this for different layers. So that's how we make the two objectives uh, collaborate with each other and also transferring um, uh, supervision or knowledge uh, uh, between each other. So this is the, uh, the high level idea of uh, uh, our uh, infographs uh, start uh, um, model, which is uh, for the semi-supervised uh, learning setting. Okay. So we evaluate the model on, on some standard uh, benchmark of a graph classification and regression. So here we compare some uh, traditional graph kernel methods and also some recent unsupervised graph um, repetition methods like graph to vec Okay, so our method is able to um, consistently outperform these two kinds of methods uh, in both unsupervised and, and the semi-supervised setting. So I will not like uh, go to the details. Okay, so this is the, the, the first problem which focus on predicting the, the, the property of um, uh, chemical structure. And the second problem, as we said before, is, is actually the inverse problem of molecular property prediction. So which is a molecule design and optimization. So in this case, we are given a property and then we want to find a molecule which try to satisfy this given property. Okay. So as we said, like molecule uh, can be represented as a graph, then essentially this problem is, is, is corresponding to graph generation. We try to generate a molecule, we try to generate a graph, okay? And then in machine learning literature, recently we see, we, we've seen big progress in data generation uh, based on deep joint models. For example, right now we are, we are, we are able to 
um, generate very realistic, realistic images based on models like GANs, uh, version old encoders, or, or like normalizing flows. Okay, we are also able to generate very realistic images based on models like GPT-2, and now we are even able to have like GPT-3, which are much more powerful, right? But how are we able to generate graphs? So graphs are much more challenging because the structure of graphs are not predetermined and they are discrete. So that's, um, uh, um, that's uh, add, uh, um, um, add a lot of challenge uh, to the problem. Okay, so in this is I, I clear, so we propose a new model called a graph AF for molecular graph generation. Okay. So the high level idea of graph AF is, um, is trying to formulate the graph generation process as a sequential decision process. So basically, um, um, uh, we will start from an empty graph, so there's no bound, no atoms, no edges, okay? And then in every step, we will are trying to generate a new atom. For example, in the first step, we are going to generate a, a carbon, and in the second step, we're going to generate another uh, atom, which is oxygen, okay? And you can see in every step, we generate a new atom. And in the meantime, we also have to determine what will be the bonds between this um, uh, new atom with each of the existing atoms. For example, here, once we generate this new um, carbon, uh, we need to determine what will be the bonds between this new carbon with this uh, carbon, right? So for example, this could be a, uh, there, there is a single bond between, between the two carbons, and there are no um, bonds, no edges between this carbon and this oxygen, right? And then there's no bonds between these uh, two carbon as well. Okay. So we can continue the generation process at here at some point. So there are no edges between the between the new atom uh, uh, with each of the atom in the current graph. So we will stop the generation process. Okay. And specifically, we actually use a, an, an auto regressive flow model to, to model the whole process. So before introducing the auto, uh, the auto regressive uh, flow model, so we are going to introduce what is a what is a what is a flow model, what is a normalizing flow. Okay. So I, I will give some uh, high level idea of normalizing flow. So normalizing flow is some very recent uh, uh, technique uh, in in machine learning literature. So which has been growing, uh, which has been attracting a growing interest in in last two years. So basically. Normalizing flows defines an invertible mapping from a base distribution uh, to the to a very uh, very complicated distribution. For example, um, all observation data. Okay, so usually for the base distribution, this could be simple as a Gaussian distribution, and this usually corresponds to the um, the latent space, and this is the the data space or the observation space, and this the distribution from the latent space to the uh, to the uh, the observation space or the data space, this is a uh, one-one mapping, okay? And actually we can define the mapping based on uh, neural networks, okay? So the good thing about normalizing flow is that, so we are actually um, able to calculate the exact likelihood of data. For example, if we want to calculate the, the, the likelihood of data X in the, in the data space, so we can actually map them into the latent space and we can get the probability in the latent space, which is very easy to calculate because this is, this is a simple Gaussian distribution, right? But be, beside this probability, we also need to uh, add, uh, multiply by some, by the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of the transformation uh, function, okay? So, so based on this uh, change of variable theorem, so we are actually able to evaluate the exact likelihood of data, which is not possible for uh, other joint models like GANs or version old encoders. Like for GANs, you basically you cannot calculate the likelihood, right? But for models like uh, uh, version old encoders, you're only able to calculate the, the lower bound. So, so graph AF is, is actually, um, uh, actually defines an invertible mapping from a base distribution uh, uh, which is Gaussian distribution to the to the observations in our case, which is uh, which is a, uh, a graph. So as mentioned in the beginning, so we can actually uh, transform each graph um, as a sequence of nodes and edges, right? So uh, basically, for example, this could be a carbon and this carbon, um, this uh, oxygen, and then the, the set action could be the the, the, the edges between the, the the atoms, right? So you can you can you can uh, you can transform a graph 
into a sequence of nodes and edges. So here specifically, we actually use the, the breadth first uh, search order to, to transform a graph into a sequence of nodes and edges. And then, so you can see that for each um, action in the sequence, so we can actually associate it with a random variable. So each random variable is from a, from a base distribution, for example, Gaussian distribution. That's how we are able to define a mapping between the uh, base distribution uh, to the uh, to the observation space in here is a, a sequence of nodes and the edges. Okay? So you can see that the base distribution is basically a high dimensional uh, Gaussian distribution and here is our observation space. So this is the, uh, this is the invertible map. Okay, so the so so I will give some high level idea why we, ha we have to use this looks very complicated like uh, techniques. What is the advantage using such kinds of like a uh, uh, flow technique? So the first advantage is that for the normalizing flow, because we actually define some mapping from the base distribution to the data, spa, uh, data distribution. So we can use uh, multiple layers of nonlinear uh, neural networks. So that means uh, we are able to model very complicated uh, data distribution. So therefore the capacity of the uh, normalized flows are usually very high. So this is one big advantage in terms of their capacity in modeling different kinds of like the data. Okay. And the second one is also the generation process is sequential, but the training process is, is actually parallel. So, so, so therefore uh, the training could be very efficient. And also the, the, the inference or the sampling process can remain as sequential. The sequential uh, uh, generation uh, nature is actually very, uh, important because so during the generation process in each step we're going, we are either trying to generate a node or trying to generate an edge and then in every step we can actually uh, check the chemical rules for example based on the uh, for the current the substructure are, are they able to satisfy um, all the chemical rules or not if they are not able to satisfy the chemical rules so we are going to stop the generation process and start the generation process again okay so this is a good way to guarantee um, the, the molecule we generated are always valid. Okay. And here are some results. Um, uh, so we evaluate the models on some standard uh, benchmarks of uh, molecule generation. So here we use a link 250k dataset. So this dataset is basically uh, includes around like 250k uh, drug-like molecules. So the maximum atom in this dataset is around 38. There are nine atom types and three edge types. So here we compare different kinds of models in terms of different metrics. So, so the valid, valid, validity is basically um, measures uh, whether the molecules are chemical valid or not. So you can see that for most models, so, um, so they're actually able to generate 100% molecules. Uh, this is because all these molecules, they, they, they include the, the, the chemical rules. That's why they can always guarantee the validity of the generated molecules. So this is uh, the first metric, which is validity. The second one um, is uniqueness, which measures, basic measures, uh, whether the journey molecules are different from each other, right? So you can see that uh, for most models, we are able to generate very different molecules. And the third metric, uh, the third important metric is the novelty, basic measures, um, uh, whether the journey molecules are different from the training data. Otherwise, we can always just copy from the training data, right? Which doesn't make uh, too much sense, but you can still get a very good performance uh, 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 in the first two metrics. Okay. So you can see that all, 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 all graph F models are able to generate valid, uh, uh, unique, and also a new molecule by training on uh, a large set of molecules. So this is a uh, the, 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 the first task, which is basically trying to generate very realistic molecules. So here's some results of the molecules we generated, which looks like uh, pretty uh, realistic. But of course, there's still some problem there. For example, some of the structure could be, could, may not exist in practice because uh, this doesn't look like a, a ring. Okay, so, 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 so the first part basically focus on generating um, realistic uh, molecule generation. But in practice, generating the uh, realistic molecules are not, uh, is not sufficient because our goal is actually trying to um, generate a molecule uh, with design properties. So that's why in the second part, we focus on uh, the goal-directed molecule generation. 
So our goal is trying to uh, search a molecule which can satisfy, satisfy our constraint or our goal. Okay. So here we, uh, we use uh, reinforcement learning techniques. So as we mentioned in the beginning, because we actually formulate the molecule generation or graph generation as a sequential decision process. So therefore we can actually use reinforcement learning process uh, uh, or techniques to fine tune our, uh, our generation uh, policy. Or, um, uh, specifically, uh, so we can define um, some of the important concepts in reinforced learning. For example, what is the state? So state is basically the current subgraph. What is the current substructure you have generated so far? And then uh, what are the actions? So there are two kinds of actions. The first kind of action is, uh, uh, is trying to generate a new atom. So this is uh, the first kind of action. And the second kind of action is uh, we are gonna generate a new edge between the new atom with uh, each of the uh, existing atoms. So this is another type of action. And then, so in terms of like the reward, so which is not uh, too difficult to design. For example, so we can use the properties of molecules as a final reward because the properties of molecules is something we, we, we care about, right? So that's why we can use the properties of molecules as a final reward. And also we can use the chemical validity as some sort of like either uh, intermediate reward or final reward because actually during the generation process as we uh, said in, uh, previously. So uh, during the generation process, we can check whether the molecules are valid or not. Okay, so, so that's why we can use the chemical validity as an intermediate reward. But of course the final reward because we want to, sh we want to make sure the final molecule, the molecules um, uh, generated uh, in the last step uh, will be valid. Okay. And then so we can fine tune the generation process based on, based on reinforcement learning techniques. So here specifically you, we use some polis gradient uh, optimization technique. So here are some results. So here, um, so we focus on two kinds of properties, uh, two properties. So one is P log P, um, another one is the QED, so which basic, basically measures the, the drug likeness of the, the molecules. So here we, uh, we, sh we uh, show or we compare the results of different methods in terms of the, the, the top three molecules they search. Okay, so you can see that um, uh, our molecules are able to, uh, our, result, our model are able to outperform uh, some of the uh, state art models in, in, in the literature. Okay. Uh, of course, um, uh, right now, uh, there, are, there are new models which, uh, which uh, are able to do better because uh, this paper is published in, um, uh, it, it was on archive like last year, but you know how, how fast uh, it's, it's, it's now in, in machine learning literature. So it's this, this sort of like an old, an old paper, okay. So there's a new, new techniques for sure uh, that's able to do better. Okay. So here's, uh, I show some examples of the, the best molecules we, we, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've, I, we've searched or we've, we've identified for the two properties. So you can see that for the P log P, so we've identified some molecules, uh, some, uh, some molecules with uh, optimal P, uh, P log P properties. And here we, we've identified um, some molecules with, uh, which has good uh, drug likeness. Okay. Of course, I have to mention here, here we actually focus on a single property optimization. That means like we only trying to find a molecule uh, which satisfy, uh, which try to maximize a single property. But in practice, uh, I think uh, a more realistic setting is trying to do multi-objective optimization. So basically you try to find a molecule which are able to uh, satisfy multiple properties. So there are a lot of uh, recent uh, research on this topic. Okay, um, so here are some more experiments in terms of a constraint optimization. Because remember that in the, if you re remember in the in the uh, the, uh, uh, the in introduction of the drug discovery process. So sometimes we we are not generate the molecules from uh, from scratch. So we will start from an existing molecule and then try to modify the molecules in order to improve their their properties. So here basically we evaluate that setting. So we will start from an, uh, an existing molecules and then we are going to make some uh, a few changes. For example, we we add some atoms, we, we remove some atoms, and we add some edges or remove some edges. So by making only a few changes, we hope to significantly improve the the, the property of the molecules. So here in in this case, you can see that by making a uh, very tiny changes, uh, we are able to significantly improve the property of the, the molecules. Okay. 
So this is um, uh, the, the second problem, which is um, uh, uh, molecule design and optimization. So basically, we try to identify a designed uh, uh, drug candidate. Okay. As we said like in the beginning, uh, mo most of the time, the, drugs we, uh, we, the, the drug structure we design may not exist uh, in nature. So we must uh, think about how uh, are we able to synthesize those molecule structures uh, based on the uh, existing ones. So that's related to the problem of retrosensor prediction or retrosensor planning. So basically, in this case, we are given a designed molecule structure, and we are going to uh, we want to identify a set of like uh, molecules or reactants which could be used to synthesize the target molecule structure. Okay, so this is called like a retrosensor prediction or, or planning. Okay. Uh, or spe uh, and specifically, um, in this year's ICML, we propose a new uh, uh, algorithm, which is called like a graph-to-graph -graph framework. Okay, so the essential idea is like this: because remember that uh, each molecule is a is a graph, and then we want to uh, we want to uh, find a set of reactants, a set of molecules to 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 synthesize a target molecule. So that's why mathematically it can be formulated as a graph, uh, a mapping from the graph, which is a targeted molecule, to a set of graphs, which, which are the reactants. Okay? And then um, the whole framework can, can actually be divided into two stages, so, uh, which, is, uh, which are uh, reaction center ident identification and also graph translation. So let's look at uh, a little bit more details. So the framework looks like this. So here is a target molecule. Okay? And then what we are going to do is we want to identify where the reaction happens okay so basically we try to identify the the the, the reaction center once we identify the reaction center what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to break the reaction center uh, and then uh, and then the target molecule will be uh, broken into two uh symptoms or two uh different substructures okay so if you break this one you can you can you can get these two different substructures remember that for the symptoms or the uh, they are not complete structure. They are not complete uh, molecules. So that's why we have the second stage, uh, the graph translation stage. So basically in this stage, we are going to um, complete the synthon into, uh, into a complete uh, molecules. Okay, so each, each of the complete molecule will be, will be, will correspond to a reactant, reactant. So we can do this for each, uh, each of the things on here, and then we can get a reactant, uh, a different reactant here. So by doing this, we can actually map uh, 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 the target model structure to a set of like reactants. So, so specifically for the reaction center prediction problem, we actually can formulate, formulate this as a supervised uh, classification problem. So basically for two atoms, uh, a pair of atoms, if there's a bond between them in the, in the product molecule and, 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 there, and there's no bonds between them in the reactants. So basically, we treat, we treat these kind, this kinds of like a, a, a pairs as a re reaction center. And then we can, we can formulate the reaction center prediction as a supervised problem. So basically, uh, we can... So this is basically related to an, an edge classification problem, right? So we can use a graph neural network to learn the rotations of the nodes and, and the edges. And then we, we can do a binary classification to, to determine whether each edge is a reaction center node, right? So this is a, a reaction center prediction. And the, in the stage of graph translation, so Algo is trying to uh, uh, translate the incomplete symptom to the final reactant, right? Because the symptom is a graph structure and, and the, the, the final reactant is also a graph structure. So that's why we propose a, a graph translation uh, framework, okay? So specifically, we use a variational graph to graph uh, translation framework. So here we introduce a latent variable Z so, uh, to capture the uncertainty. The, re the reason that we want to introduce the latent variable Z is that because sometimes for, uh, for the same synthon, they can be translated to a different reactant. Okay, so there's some uncertainty there. So that's why we, we introduce a latent variable uh, to, uh, to, to, to model the uncertainty. Okay. So the, the whole process is very similar to the, uh, to the uh, to, to machine translation, but, but instead of focus on uh, um, uh, sequence translation, here we focus on the graph translation. But the, the high level idea is pretty uh, similar. 
So we, we evaluate our models on some standard benchmark data set on, on, on uh, retrosynthesis uh, predictions. So we compare with some uh, uh, temporary free approaches, which means that we don't need to use domain knowledge and also some temporary based approaches, uh, which basically have to use domain knowledge. So our approach is able to out significant outperform the sequence to sequence method, which basically treat molecules as a sequence because molecules uh, before uh, um, uh, uh, treating molecules as graph and another way to represent molecules is uh, using their smile string, which is a sequence. Okay? And then the whole problem can be formulated as a sequence to sequence uh, tr translation problem. So our graph to graph framework is able to significant outperform the sequence to sequence model, which is not surprising because graph uh, reputation is able to capture the complex relationship between the between different atoms. So our model, uh, model is able to um, get very close performance with the state art uh, temporary based approaches. But for these approaches, they need to uh, involve domain knowledge, which could be, uh, which may not be uh, able to generalize to new domains. Okay. So I don't have enough time, but maybe um, I can briefly introduce um, uh, other topics, uh, introduce uh, 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 other topics uh, down in my group. Okay. So one, uh, another recent topic we've been trying to uh, working on is um, trying to go beyond the current uh, direction of uh, modeling molecules as a, a two-dimensional graph. Because for molecules, actually a more natural and also intrinsic reputation is if they are 3D. Uh, 3D structures, sometimes we call them 3D conformations, right? Because this, all these 3D conformations, 3D structure actually determine their, their biological or physical act activities, okay? So that's why we want to move beyond from 2D to 3D conformations, okay? Uh, but, but unfortunately, unfortunately, actually in practice, uh, for most molecules, we don't know their 3D structure, okay? So therefore, uh, a problem we study here is are we able to predict the stable conformations or stable 3D structures uh, based on their two-dimensional uh, graph? So this is the, the problem we, we tackle here, okay? So for, for such a traditional, uh, for such a, uh, a problem, the traditional approaches uh, uh, including, uh, include the uh, experimental methods like a crystal or graphy, uh, which is very expensive and time consuming. There are also some recent uh, computation methods based on, on molecular dynamics or Markov chain model cover, but these methods are also very computation expensive and also, uh, uh, and, and they, they are also uh, specifically expensive for very large molecules like proteins. Okay? So that's why recently there are a lot of like uh, interest and also progress based on uh, machine learning approaches or data driven approaches. So in this case, basically, we try to predict the molecule conformations uh, are given the molecule graph G. So basically, we try to model this conditional distribution. Okay? So however, even from the point of view of machine learning, uh, it's very challenging because um, the conformation R, they are rotation and translation equivalent. That means that if you rotate the, 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 the conformations, uh, the, the coordinates will, will change, but, but they, they are still the same confirmation, right? So that's something you need to model, which is a very challenging. Okay? And the second uh, challenge is that for each molecule, they actually have multiple, multiple stable confirmations. So that means this conditional uh, distribution is multi mod right? So, and, and they are very complex. Okay? So, so we recently uh, uh, proposed some, we recently like, developed some new approaches uh, based on uh, normalizing flows um, uh, for molecule uh, conformation uh, generation. So this is mainly done by my grad student, Ming Kai and Shi Tun, and also a collaboration with Joshua Benjamin and, and uh, uh, GMP in UIOC. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm possible that we don't have time to go into the details, but, um, but the paper is, um, uh, is in submission to iClip. Maybe you can, you, can, uh, you can find the paper there and, and, and we will receive the notification version. Okay, and then here maybe I can show some of the results here. So here's a, some, um, uh, some examples of generative uh, conformations for molecules uh, using our model. So here given a graph, so we are able to generate different stable conformations for, for the given molecule graph, okay. 
And so you see here different examples. Here we actually give a visualization how our model are able to uh, generate um, uh, stable confirmations. So basically the model will start from some random positions and the model will gradually uh, crack themselves and then eventually uh, find the stable confirmations. Okay. Also, by the way, this actually relates to um, uh, some recent progress on protein structure prediction. So, you, you know, I think last week or the week before last week, there's a huge uh, 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 result or breakthrough in terms of like AI for, for, uh, for protein structure prediction, right? So, so that problem, so our problem is actually very related to that problem as well. So for, for, for AlphaFold or AlphaFold 2, so their goal is trying to predict the protein structure the, or the, the three D structure of the proteins, and for protein, there are also molecules, but 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 they are very big molecules. And then, so in that uh, model, so the input will be a sequence, which is the the, the amino acid sequence of the of the proteins, and they, they try to predict the three D structures of the of the proteins as well. And so in our case, we actually focus on uh, on small molecules. So we we try to predict the three D structures of uh, uh, of three uh, of um, of small molecules. So there's some connection between our work and also the, the recent uh, alpha uh, fold or uh, protein structure prediction uh, results. Okay. And then, so, so by far, we basically only talk about like uh, uh, molecules, which are small graphs. And then next, there are also some very important research in terms of like uh, big graphs. So in drug discovery, not only have like small graphs like molecules, but also big 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 graph like a, a notch a medical notch graph. So med uh, for medical notch graph, basically um, they encode the relationship between different kinds of like uh, medical entities, like uh, relationship between disease, drug, and phenotype, genes, proteins, and side effects. So we can construct um, the relationship between these uh, these entities based on a variety of different data sources, for example, the multi-omic data and also biomedical literature like PubMed. So there's a, there's a huge like, effort and also interest in, in the biomedical community in building big med medical notch graph for, for a variety of like, uh, applications or purpose. And the one specific application we care about is actually drug repurposing. So basically, uh, what, is the, what is the goal of drug repurposing? So the goal is trying to, uh, given, a, given a disease or, or could be a new disease, we're trying to identify um, effective drugs from the approved list. Okay, for example, uh, actually there's a lot of research this year uh, for um, uh, drug repurposing for, for COVID-19, right? Suppose given the COVID-19 uh, disease, are we able to identify uh, a few drugs, a few drugs from the approved list, uh, which could be useful to treat COVID-19 uh, Disease. So actually, uh, this relates to uh, the, the link prediction uh, task on, 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 on notch graph. So for the, for the bi biomedical notch graph, so we have a, a different kinds of relationship between, for example, uh, uh, disease, uh, drugs, and, and genes or proteins. And the algorithm is trying to predict the links between the drugs and the disease. Okay. So, so this still, uh, we, we still have some, uh, this, this project is, is still uh, ongoing. And to summarize, uh, um, so uh, I think there's a huge potential of AI in accelerating the, uh, in revolutionize the, the process of drug discovery, which used to be very slow and expensive. But now we have so much uh, data in the biomed biomedical domain, so we can use AI techniques to extract uh, evidence and then identify promising drug candidates. Okay? And the many data in this domain are actual graph structure. For example, the molecules, uh, which are small graphs, and also the biomedical knowledge graph, which are very big graphs. And then that's why so the recent graph representation learning techniques or graph new networks has, has, has a huge potential in, in, in drug discovery. So uh, there, there are a few fundamental uh, problems like uh, molecule property predictions and also uh, uh, molecule design and optimizations, retrosynthesis predictions, uh, or drug repurposing. So in the future, I think there, there are also uh, uh, quite a, a, a few 
uh, important directions to work on. So the one direction is the one I just mentioned. So most of the current uh, techniques are based on 2D uh, graphs. I think in the future, it's, it will be very important to move from 2D graph to, uh, to 3D structures, the 3D conformations of the molecules, which actually are more intrinsic and, and natural and, and, and determines the, the, bi uh, the, the biologic and also physical act, uh, activities of, of molecules. So another big direction I think is um, uh, drug discovery with very limited labor data because compared to uh, other domains of AI like computer vision, natural language uh, understanding or spatial recognition, um, the number of labor data in drug discovery are very limited okay? and it's very um, uh, expensive and, 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 and time consuming to obtain, right? So I think uh, we, there, there are a lot of space uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in this direction, so we can explore different kinds of techniques, for example, active learning, self-supervised learning, multi-tax or transfer learning or, or future learning. Okay. So this space, I think, is still very uh, open. Okay. And then I also want to do a little bit of advertisements. We actually have a tutorial in this year's uh, Triple AI with some, with some friends on, on AI for drug discovery, so we, I'm going to speak in the tutorial with, uh, with Fei Wang from Connect and also Fei Xiong Chen uh, from uh, Cleveland Clinic. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, so you're welcome to, 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 to check out our tutorial in, in February. And then finally, I want to thank all my students and the collaborators and the sponsors which make this happen. And this is some reference for this talk. Uh, with that, I will stop here and, and happy to take some questions. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, so uh, we do have some time for uh, Q and A. Um, so please feel free to uh, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, you can or you can also type it uh, your question into the chat window so I can uh, possibly repeat. Uh, hi, I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So I have a question about the. Uh, combination of reinforcement learning and uh, graph AF that you were explaining uh, and particularly my question about is about like constraint optimization part that you were talking about like improving an existing like a uh, molecule yes. so uh, so in that case your what is your like uh, action space because I think it is not going to be like autoregressive anymore like is the action space and the status state space probably should be the same? Um, that's a good question. Um, but here, um, so let me check. I mean, so once, so you, you can you can still sort of like transform uh, uh, transform the 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 original uh, molecule as a sequence, right? And yeah. then. For the next action, I mean, you can still generate an atom for sure. I mean, you can you can you can put a new atom, right? And then you can still determine the, uh, and then next you can still determine what would be the edge between this new atom with each of the atom in the original molecule structure. I think you can do still pretty much do the same thing, right? Okay. So I think about how the molecule is generated. Basically, you generate a new atom, and then you can you, you're going to need to determine what would be the edges between this new atom with each of the um, um, atom in the mm -hmm. existing substructure. Maybe it doesn't follow the 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 breath first uh, such strategy, but I think you, you can still pretty much do the, do the same thing. I okay, say. I see. And uh, uh, and in uh, so uh, like when you were comparing your your approach with other method like GCP, and there was a table uh, like at the beginning like the first half the first kind of part yeah uh, validity without check this one so what right. do you mean by validity without check because in this like uh, comparison i can see like graph af um, is pretty much the same like for example at gcpn but there's a huge difference in terms of like validity without check right so what, so, what the, yeah. yeah that's a good question as a uh, as a as I mentioned here, um, so that's why it's a good thing for, um, uh, for graph AF, uh, the sampling process is sequential. So remember that for, for graph AF, so at, at every step we generate node or generate edge, right? And then, and then we can get a substructure. And then, and then and at every step, we are going to check whether the, the current substructure are valid or not based on the chemical rules. Yes. 
So, so, so can, we can do this as long as the model, uh, their sampling process are sequential, right? So yes. that's how we are, we, that's how uh, we are able to incorporate the, the chemical rules during the sampling process. Okay. Yes. So, so for the, for the validity without check, that means like during the generation process, we don't, we don't do the uh, validity check during the, uh, in the intermediate uh, generation process. Oh, and then okay, we only okay. we only, we only vary them whether the molecules are valid or not uh, once the molecule is already uh, generated in the mm -hmm. in the last step, right? And, and, and in here is you are also using reinforcement learning, yeah? Uh, here, oh, here, here, here is a basic focus on uh, generating the realistic molecules. Here we don't have for like reinforcement. Reinforcement is like the goal directed task, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. here we only like, uh, we don't use reinforcement. Here's basic only like MLE maximum likelihood, right? So we only focus oh, okay. on generating like realistic molecules. There's no reinforcement in, in this part. Okay. Uh, and my last question is actually all of these approaches, your work like yeah, is applicable to directed graphs as well? Because I think like in the molecule generation, it's just for undirected case, yeah? Uh, for on direct graph, um, that's a good question. I, I think it, sh it should be flexible to uh, modify those approaches for direct uh, for direct graph because if you check the um, the idea or the uh, or the techniques of graphing network is actually designed for a uh, directed graph, right? So, you, for example, the messages actually they they, they are defined on the uh, direct edges. Mm -hmm. So okay. I think it should be easy very easily to, to, to modify those techniques for a directed graph. I, I wouldn't say it's a very difficult thing. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Um, so I think we have, uh, we have a few uh, questions in the, in the chat window. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, great. So the, the first one is similar to the 3D confirmation, even for 2D graph generation problem, say adjacency, adjacency matrix is used as graph structure. Uh, how to deal with uh, the issue of isomorphism uh, or ensuring the permutation invariant? Okay, so the, the problem is you don't deal with that. So for, for a given molecule, as long as you can generate in some way, that's fine. We don't, we don't deal with that uh, problem in graph generation. Right? You, can, you can generate the, the graph in different ways, but as long as, long as you can generate in some way, then that's fine. That's, that's I think, the, uh, this... I, I, that's my understanding, but of course it would be perfect if you can you can you can model this like isomorphism or or, or, or permutation invariant issue. But but I think in practice this this is a very difficult problem. And then from the point of view of like uh, the practical uh, application, it doesn't matter because as long as we can change the molecule in some specific way, I, I think that should be fine. So, uh, oh, uh, so I, I also would like to uh, make a short kind of a announcement that we also have a, a little bit of advertisement at the end of uh, today's talk. So please stay with us. Uh, and uh, 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 so the, the other uh, question that's here is uh, from uh, Dong Hong Cai. Uh, so except the domain each uh, graph generation model aims to, uh, what's the difference between graph AF and the graph RN? Right. So yeah, so graph iron also um, uh, generate the graph in a sequential way, but like the, the big difference is that uh, graph AF use um, uh, the normalizing flow framework. So that's a big difference between the two. So as I mentioned like uh, uh, during the talk, a big advantage of using um, uh, the, flow frame, uh, the flow framework, uh, actually there are, two, there are two advantage. So the first advantage is that the flow method, um, so usually we are able to um, define a very uh, flexible uh, um, density function. That means the capacity of the uh, flow model is usually much larger than the, the autoregressive auto model. So which, uh, which means that we are able to model the complex distributions of the molecule. So this is uh, the first advantage, which, which is the, the, the strong capacity of the flow-based uh, model. And the second advantage is that uh, because of the, for the flow mo model, um, uh, although the generation process is sequential, but actually the training process actually uh, can be done in parallel. So that's another advantage in terms of like computational efficiency. Great. So 
another question from uh, Mohit is uh, uh, that uh, regarding using uh, RL algorithm to generate the graphs with property as reward, is it feasible to know the properties of the generated molecules to be used for reward? Is it feasible to know the properties of it? Um, or would you, uh, Mohit, you can actually, if you want to clarify, uh, or uh, feel free to speak up. Yeah, sure. So basically, uh, I think in the slide it was mentioned that uh, basically the reward function is kind of the properties that are uh, of the that are the properties of the generated molecules are kind of used as reward right. functions. Right. So, but now, so my question is like uh, like how do we know the properties of the generated molecules? Okay. Yeah. Right. So so usually in practice, I think I think um, so. Um, what we do is so we will use a proxy. Uh, for the reward function. So we will train a machine learning model. So basically the, the, the property prediction model we, we, we introduce in the first part as a, as a, as, as a reward uh, function. So we will train a machine learning model and then given molecule, we, we can predict their, their, their property. So that's what we did. Uh, that's what we, we, we did um, uh, uh, competitionally. But of, of course in practice, uh, once you really have a molecule, if you want, want to know the chemical properties, so you actually have to evaluate them through like uh, uh, clinical trials. But, but during the machine learning stage or during the, uh, um, during the, uh, in the beginning of the uh, drug discovery stage, we, we usually train a machine learning model to predict the properties of molecules. Um, so another uh, question is from Taiwan. Um, so uh, thank you for the nice presentation, especially uh, the creative way to predict uh, the conformation with lowest energy. Um, so besides the lowest energy conformation, compounds may have several other local energy minima. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you uh, uh, can your future model can your future model predict those local energy minima and uh, output their probability as well? Yeah, sure. Because so actually we we model the 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 probability of the we actually model the probability of the conformations condition on the molecular graph, right? So that's why we can always uh, uh, output their probability. Of course, the, the the conformation as well. And also, as I mentioned, that's why actually the problem is very challenging because each molecule can have multiple stable conformations. And and then you can say in our results for each molecule. Uh, we do predict multiple different conformations, stable conformations. I mean. Okay, so uh, do we have more questions from the audience? Any, any um, okay, so here's a, another one from Changqing. Uh, so, what progress in the field of AI-based drug discovery in a couple of years can you see? Uh, I think, um, well, yeah, this is part of the question, I guess it's uh, probably, there's also a second part, but I, I guess, yeah, feel free to start. Right. Um, that's a good question, but diff difficult question as well. I mean, right now, it's really hard to predict uh, uh, in a few years, sometimes, I mean, it's, it's very predict like next five years sometimes it's even, it's even uh, predict uh, it's even difficult to predict the next year because like everything is, is happening so fast but then I, I, but in general I, I think there are some many people believe uh, uh, I mean in the future maybe we can um, we can find a new drug within one year that could be possible like uh, within next 10 years and and then and then there are already already a lot of like progress um in in the in the industry right now there's a lot of like new startups uh, focused on ai for drug discovery and, and those startups actually work very closely with the with, with the big farmers pseudo companies and and then and those those for those uh, big uh, those like uh, ai for drug discovery companies so basically they will generate new uh, drug candidates or compounds for the pharmaceutical companies, and the pharmaceutical companies are able to uh, evaluate those uh, candidates. So I think uh, we see we see a lot of progress. I think in at the beginning of this year, there's actually a paper published uh, in Nature by 
startup called like in silico in silico medicine uh, which is located in in uh, i forgot the location but basically i think in that paper they said like they uh, before uh, if you do, if you don't use like machine learning or different uh, it, it may take like uh, two or three years uh, for for the heat generations uh, for the stage of heat generation but with uh, ai so basically you can um, shorten that period within like uh, one month or two months. Yeah. Not sure whether uh, answer your question, but I would say definitely there will be a huge progress. I think definitely I I totally believe AI will um, revolutionize the, the field, but uh, it's hard to predict when or it's hard to, uh, it's hard to predict. I would say. Yeah. So I think, yeah, we have a, a kind of a maybe related question, which is, um, have you applied your approach to discovery of uh, COVID-19 vaccine? Oh, we, have, we haven't worked on like COVID like vaccine, but we do work on COVID drug repurposing. So we actually, we st there's still some ongoing research at Mila. Uh, so at Mila, we have a really big effort uh, working on drug repurposing for COVID-19. So basically, we we try to identify uh, uh, the 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 drugs from the approved list for for treating COVID nineteen. But specifically in our project, actually, we focus on actually uh, um, um, predicting drug combinations. Which means like sometimes you know um, uh, we actually try to uh, identify a set of drugs for tr treating COVID nineteen because sometimes in uh, uh, in order to treat a, a disease, uh, one single drug is not effective. Uh, it's not effective. We we usually have to use multiple drugs, okay, or uh, multiple uh, uh, or, or a combination of drugs, okay. So that's uh, some ongoing research, uh, Amila. So I I also participate in in that project as well. So uh, another question from um, Jian Kang. Um, so thank you for the, for the great talk. Um, in, so there are two questions. One, the first one is uh, instead of graph level embeddings versus node level embeddings, uh, is there any difference between infograph and uh, DJI? And uh, the second question is compared with uh, Deep InfoMax, uh, which uses Info NCE. Is there any advantage of using JSD based mutual information estimator? Right. Uh, for the first question, I've said there's some tiny difference. I I I I can't remember exactly, but you can you can check out the paper. But I think another big difference for DGI, they only focus on uh, on supervised setting, and for infographic, we also study semi-supervised uh, learning as well. So there's uh, there's a big difference. Okay. So for the second question, compared with uh, which is. Uh, I think the two are actually pretty much the same. Very similar. There's some tiny difference. I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't rec recommend one over another, but they are, they are pretty much very similar. The two the the two the two techniques. So basically, are all like uh, contrastive learning based techniques. Okay. So uh, any any more questions? Uh, you can just uh, speak up uh, as well. Uh, don't have to type. Maybe I ask one question, this is Jim Pei. So uh, in the um, problem of um, you know, pr um, producing a graph with some properties, uh, the, maybe a challenge is that given one property, there could be many different uh, structures satisfying this property. Yeah. Then uh, how can you judge the uh, quality of your model? Yeah. I mean, uh, from the practical point of view, instead of from the uh, pure mathematical machine learning definition. Right. So yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think in practice, I mean, one way uh, is, uh, uh, so there, there's, there's, there's some, sometimes there's, uh, the property is actually a, a value. You can compare the, the magnitude of the property. For example, uh, we, we, you can choose the, the one with maximum value. So that's uh, one thing. So another thing, sometimes you need to verify other properties as well, because sometimes, uh, as I said uh, in the talk, so for drug discovery is usually a multi-objective optimization problem. So uh, instead of only maximizing uh, the, uh, a, a single property, 
but we also need to check other property. For example, maybe for one molecule, their, their, uh, uh, their, their, their binding to the proteins is very good, but their toxicity could be very large. So in that case, uh, we, still, we will still not choose that molecule. So I think eventually, in practice, we need to um, actually uh, check uh, the prop, uh, multiple objectives multiple objectives for, for a single molecule to see whether they are able to achieve a good performance in all the objectives or all the properties. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any, any other questions? Okay. All right, so uh, let's, uh, I guess, thank uh, Professor Jiantang again. Uh, and uh, so in the, in the end, uh, so uh, I have also, or the, the data science group here at SFU, uh, we uh, also have a little bit, uh, kind of a, a quick uh, advertisement here. Um, let me share my screen as well. I guess I right, uh, let me see. I think this is, let me see if it's working actually. Okay, so this one is too small. Okay, uh, so thanks uh, everyone for staying with us uh, uh, this long. Um, and uh, the data science, so we're the SFU data science research group and we have currently uh, five faculty members uh, together uh, here, uh, I think uh, Professor Martin Martin Astor is also here. Uh, Professor Jian Pei, Jenna Wan, and uh, Ki Wang, including myself. Uh, in the end, uh, we actually are recruiting students. Uh, this is the uh, also the uh, student application season. So, uh, if uh, you're interested, if you're a student uh, looking for graduate study opportunities, um, and uh, you're interested in this uh, one of these areas, please feel free to contact. Uh, and also uh, feel free to uh, spread uh, the word to people who you might be, who you might know, uh, who you know might be uh, interested in uh, graduate studies. Um, uh, we have, there's more information also on our website, uh, data.cs.sfu.ca, uh, and uh, feel free to uh, contact us. Um, so this is, like I said, this is, um, uh, today's talk is uh, the last one in, uh, in the fall semester. And uh, uh, we thank everyone who have uh, joined our previous talks and this talk as well. Um, we will continue our series in the uh, upcoming spring 2021 semester as well. Uh, and we will uh, continue to post uh, uh, all the talk details uh, in our uh, website uh, at data.cs.svu.ca slash TDSA. Um, so uh, stay tuned in this uh, 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 for, for our upcoming announcements. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, hope to see you uh, next semester again. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, uh, have a nice holiday break. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.